Well, thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to provide you some, some thoughts that I'm, I'm intending to provoke you to further thought and reason for the purposes of your discussion. And, and I want to discuss in particular why it's important that we continue to educate ourselves on this topic that we're calling social entrepreneurship. And with that, I also want to share with you a bit about the research that I've recently completed in this subject area. As a provocateur, I'm going to start with proposing to you folks several questions. Several of these questions we've heard already today and several of them you've been pondering throughout our roundtable discussions. And as we discuss, as we continue to think about these questions, I want to give you some new ideas to influence your thought process. During the reception last night, I heard several conversations where people were discussing, how do you define social entrepreneurship? I think I was asked that three times from three separate individuals. And I want to ask you that right now. Think to yourselves, how do we define social entrepreneurship? Someone this morning suggested that social entrepreneurship is a mission to fill human needs. This prompts in my mind, what then have entrepreneurs traditionally been doing? As we have all discussed earlier today, social entrepreneurship is perhaps a procedural approach towards sustaining the environment, capturing its resources, and ultimately managing the subsequent impacts of our usage. Is that then social entrepreneurship? Another speaker this morning su suggested that social entrepreneurship is no longer a catchphrase, it's a necessity. Is it then the necessity to be socially responsible while making a profit and preserving or increasing the shareholder equity, as we have seen demonstrated by IBM? Or is social, social entrepreneurship the necessity of large-scale transformative impact for a segment of society who lacks the means or resources to accomplish that for themselves? such as the Grameen system of companies. And though most of us are probably aware, the Grameen system is just that, it's a system. It's not simply a financial institution that provides microfunding. It is, in fact, itself a financial social system. Is social entrepreneurship, then, getting your investment returned to you at its original value or with a sub substantial financial profit? Another speaker this morning said that anyone can be socially entrepreneurial. This may be true, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be a social entrepreneur? Who are these social entrepreneurs, and how are these people perhaps different from regular entrepreneurs, the people who we were yesterday? If this is true, we can all be socially entrepreneurial. Can we actually develop this capability intentionally in ourselves and others? Answering these questions appropriates the need for research, and the kind of research that involves data and data analysis, not simply observation and case study. While these qualitative methods of observation are useful, they leave room for confusion because they create conceptual definitions at best. The purpose of our gathering today is perhaps to alleviate some of this confusion created by the preponderance of, of our concepts and our conceptual definitions. The value of quantitative data in its analysis is that it's going to reveal to us certain empirical truths that might otherwise be difficult, if not impossible, to observe casually. When it comes to the study of behavior, the study of human values is tried and true. Through empiricism, human values have been shown consistently and reliably to describe and predict virtually all aspects of human behavior. There are several valid and reliable instruments available to measure our individual human values, and two of those instruments we'll discuss briefly today. The other interesting truth about our individual human values is that they do change. I believe someone this morning suggested that our values do not change, and while some values are lifelong and deeply seated, they are still suspect to change. And this change occurs through methods of confrontation. Our values are confronted through purposeful methods, such as taking an assessment, having dialogues with colleagues and family, or they're confronted simply as life emerges. At your table, you have a handout, and included there on page three, you'll see this problem statement. And this was the problem statement that was addressed in my dissertation research. And the statement, as I've already described to you, is that as we work towards a theoretical definition of social entrepreneurship, the challenge is that we have no empiricism, we have no empirical data that we have measured certain behaviors to build these theoretical definitions upon. We have simply our concepts through observation and dialogue. The first step, then, in working towards a theoretical 
construct of social entrepreneurship is then to, is to begin to collect some type of empirical data, empirical data that ultimately will help us describe and predict behaviors that we know are associated with these social entrepreneurs and perhaps how those behaviors differ from traditional entrepreneurs. Because we're obviously here today to discuss a distinction. And where is that distinction and how did that distinction come about? Many of us agree that the behaviors of each mirror one another. After all, like I said, many of us in this room were probably at one point just regular entrepreneurs. Using a sample drawn from LinkedIn groups, a quantitative method of analysis was conducted to answer two research questions. And you can see those research questions on this slide. And they are, what are the subset of human values that are most influential among social entrepreneurs? And how does that perhaps differ with the subset of human values that are most influential found with a segment of traditional entrepreneurs? The instrument I used is called the Rokic Value Survey. And at your table in that handout, you have a copy of this instrument. The instrument is comprised of two lists, each with 18 values. It is a list of terminal values and a list of instrumental values. And the terminal values are the desired end states that we wish to accomplish, and the instrumental values are the means by which we will behave unto those end states. It's essentially a way of assessing what is your desired means to your desired end. This particular instrument is an instrument that is using rank order data, which means I have to give one value a lower order of influence because I have given another a higher order of influence. There's another instrument we're going to talk about briefly here where there's a rank, uh, rather a rating order. I can rate every value, on, say, on a scale of one to seven. Now, we're not going to go into quantitative analysis unless anyone really wants to, but you analyze the data a little bit differently in terms of the statistical test that you conduct. But the, the two of them work fairly well together. As a matter of fact, the Schwartz value survey, which is the rating survey that I just referred to, was built as an extension or built from the Rokic value survey, which you have in the documents in front of you. And it was used to add additional insight to the motivations that are coming as a result of these values. Now, you see in, this, in your handout here and on the slide behind me the results of this analysis and the most influential terminal values and the most influential so, uh, instrumental values for each of the categories of entrepreneurs. Now, you'll notice that several of those values are common to both categories, and yet there are distinctions as well. You see also that there were some additional questions that were asked. And I would encourage you during your discussions to discuss these among yourselves. The, such some of the, the questions are, are traditional entrepreneurs in fact different from social entrepreneurs? Should we be mo more cognizant towards the development of social entrepreneurs rather than traditional entrepreneurs? And can these type of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, be developed? And on this last slide, we're seeing here where these two surveys come together to provide us some real interesting and useful insight. And all this, uh, the, the, the collection and analysis of data for the sake of generating some theoretical construct in the long run it has practical implications, which I will be getting to. But here we're going to see where these certain values that were most influential according to the Rokic value survey are mapping to the Schwartz survey. And what I want you to notice is that the values that are tending to describe the social entrepreneurs are tending to be on the side of the scale where it's called self-transcendence. The values that are most uh, likely to be the influential values for the traditional entrepreneurs are leaning to, towards the side of self-attainment or self-enhancement, I apologize. Now, earlier today, one of our speakers, Dr. Phillips, shared with us his personal uh, his, his personal realization of this important distinction of what it means to be a social entrepreneur. Is it self-transcendence? Is it self-attainment? There's a particular theory, it's a rather simple theory, so I'll share it with you. It's called the theory of reason action, and it's essentially got three components. And it says that our attitudes about our behavior and our attitudes about the outcomes of our behavior 
along with our perceived behavioral control or our competency to accomplish that behavior, are what ultimately motivate the intentions that themselves are the precursors to our behavior. And so what that basically says is, I have attitudes about something. My attitudes about those things create then my motivation, which fuels my intentions, which then are the precursors to behavior. So there's actually kind of a linear relationship there. But what's interesting is our attitudes are our values focused objectively on specific situations or specific people, perhaps. So we're seeing at the foundation of almost all of our reasoned action, we're seeing the influence of human values. And as I mentioned earlier, what's important about values is that we know that they can be influenced. We know that through methods of confrontation, perhaps taking the survey that's in front of you, uh, through conversation, that we can we can not only become aware of what our values actually are that we're functioning to sometimes automatically with that realization, but as we go through that process of recognition realization, we're confronting ourselves with certain realities. And I, we were discussing here a moment ago at our table that sometimes that confrontation is necessary at the microcosmic level, the individual of the person, in order to ultimately change the collective effect that we're all striving for. The benefit of knowing these values and what is most likely going to describe and predict social entrepreneurial behavior is going to, is the first step along the course of many steps that are going to help us develop ourselves and others as social entrepreneurs. And so I thank you for your time and I would welcome any questions uh, throughout the remainder of the afternoon. And I would invite each and every one of you to uh, contact me so that I can provide you a link to the survey. I'm going to continue to collect data. Your input is very important because as I hope I've demonstrated to you today, it takes a willingness to contribute something for the sake of data to be analyzed so that we can ultimately develop these theoretical constructs. And as I've always said to folks and my students in Africa included, theory is fun because it describes reality. And the better we know theory and the more capable we are of applying it, the more likely we are at affecting our reality. Thank you.